I would like to, uh, now if you can just take your seats again, to welcome up to the stage Jenny Evans, who's going to tell you a little bit about um, her journey with Penny Ron. So, Jenny, everybody. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you, and it's a real honour to be here. Um, unfortunately, Alex has already stolen half my speech, so I hope I'm not going to reiterate too much, but I will give you a little taste of what it's like, if you like, A, to be somebody who faces a cancer diagnosis, and B, what difference Penny Brown has made for me. I was probably, uh, you like, one of the people that would have been sitting here um, in 2015. I had a busy senior management job, I was a single parent to a 14-year-old, I haven't had a day off sick in 10 years and had a very busy, happy life. When, pretty much without warning, I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. I had a reputation for doing pretty much everything at 100 miles an hour, driving, walking, talking, whatever it was. And the best way I can describe the impact of that is exactly what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. The shockwave was profound and it really, honestly, knocked me off my feet. For the first time in my life, I was faced with the prospect of not just not being able to manage my own life, but manage life for my son too, and that was genuinely shocking to me. I was very lucky, indeed, that my sister, who is here, my younger sister, who is here with me today, had been at the long table lunch that year, and she said to me, you must go to Penny Brown. She is my younger sister, but believe me when I tell you, if Alison suggests something, it's a good idea to do it. <laughs> so, within three weeks of that diagnosis, I walked through the doors of this building for the first time and was first introduced to the whole body approach, the whole life approach. For somebody, and I guess a lot of us are like this, mildly control freak and everything's under my control, to have something given back to me that I could do for myself was incredibly important because I was being put in a place where everything was being done to me. So learning about what to eat, what I could do for myself, meditation, whatever it was, that made a huge, huge difference. It's also one of the things that I'd like to stress is there are peripheral benefits to coming here because on that very first day I sat next to a lady called Mary who has become one of my closest friends. There were times when in the depths of chemo, and I actually had chemo on Monday so if I stop speaking for a while it's because my brain has just switched off. <laughs> but in the depths of chemo when you're talking to somebody that actually is going through chemo as well, it makes a big difference. That is a person that really understands how you feel. So it's not just what you learn from the people here, it's what you learn from the people um, who are on the courses with you. In pretty short order, I had, if I say it quickly, it doesn't sound nearly so bad, a right hemicolectomy, chemo and then a livery section. And I came out the other side of that thinking, this is great, I'm now all done. Unfortunately, three months later, I was told that the cancer was back in my liver, it was also in other places, and at that point I was deemed incurable. Now that was a really profound shock. At no point had I ever thought that I would be actually never going to get well. So the first thing I did was come back here. I came back here, I went on the courses here, I went on a healing workshop, I spoke to the doctors, I spoke to the nutritionists, again that thing of trying to find and get back some sort of balance and control in dealing with what was happening to me. And it made a huge difference. It was that sense of, actually, I can do something to influence the outcome here. I'm not 100% on the very wonderful people in the NHS, but I'm not wholly dependent on somebody else to do something for me. At that point, my son was 15, and he was about to start his GCS year, GCSE year. As it happened, I had to restart chemo, and for a reason best known to itself, my body decided it really didn't like all the chemo drugs that I, in fact, already had, and I ended up unexpectedly going into hospital for four days. The impact on my son was profound and immediate. Until that point, he had been pretty much fine, but at that point, suddenly, the realisation that actually this was real hit him like a ton of bricks. And from hearing him whistling, singing, 
being his normal chatty self, I watched him disappear into a silent, dark void. And I know that all of you in this room who are mothers understand that that was worse for me than absolutely anything that was happening to me. I was very lucky, I had a GP who took it seriously, but even then, they could not get help for him. There was no support. Unfortunately, the crisis in our uh, mental health services for teenagers as such, quite fairly, that sort of support is reserved for um, teenagers who go to self-harm or at real risk. I was extremely lucky that the school that he was at stepped in at their own expense and provided for him not um, a qualified a psychologist, but a counsellor. The best way I can sum up the difference that that counsellor made for my son is that having gone from, I had A, I had the little chatty voice back again, but I don't know how many of you saw the incredible programme about Rio Ferdinand and the loss of his wife and the impact on his children. James, my son, said to me, Mum, you know, would you watch that programme with me? I said, yeah, that would be absolutely great. And we sat together, as we so often did, him on one city, me on the other, and we sat there watching the programme. And I hope I'm not going to offend anybody by saying this, but I just have this thing about the expression passed away. It doesn't work for me. And they, they used it a lot in that programme. So I was saying, I said into the silence, I said, can you do me a favour? I said, could you just not say I passed away? Could you just say I died? There was a short silence, and he said, I might just say you passed away to piss you off. <laughs> and in that moment, I knew we were all right. The elephant had been named, it was in the room, but it had been cut down to size by humour. And that is exactly how we deal with it now. Ironically, having got him sorted out, it was the time that the wheels fell off for me. And as I said, I've been here and I listened to all of the courses, but something specific triggered it. I went to, I'd just come out the other side for another six months worth of chemo, and I decided to take myself off to Cardiff to meet an old friend. As it happened, the only things I could think of to wear were clothes that I used to wear to work in. And the only bag I could think of taking was what I, I call my London bag, because we have an office in London, I spent a lot of time in London, and it used to house a laptop and papers. Now it housed snacks drinks, coats, whatever else it was, because it's quite big. So I sat there on the train, looking, if you like, for all the world as though I was going to a meeting. As we went through the, I went through the turnstiles at Cardiff Station, incredibly, two colleagues, two of my best friends actually from my former job, were going through the turnstiles too, and went, what are you doing here? And I went, well, what are you doing here? Oh, well, we're on our way to our meeting, X, Y, Z. I knew Cardiff a lot better than they did, and they said, well, can you help us find where the meeting is? That's absolutely fine. So the three of us are walking down the street in Cardiff, looking exactly as we would have done two years previously, <coughs> going off to a meeting. We got to where the meeting was. They went in, and quite literally, the door shut in my face, and I was standing out in the street. And it was in that moment that I realised that my life was forever changed. There was no way back. I could not ever be and have what I used to have and genuinely a tsunami of grief went over me because actually while I've been here and I've been listening to all this stuff about you know getting control of how you feel of getting control that's the wrong way of putting it out of a shop mm -hmm. uh, but actually learning and, and feeling what you feel more, more accurately, I have been ignoring. It's very much easier for doing all the stuff about the diet, change my diet completely, but I've really not done anything to address the emotional issues that sat underneath. And at that point, I realised how incredibly important the, the whole thing about the mind, body, spirit thing is. It is about all of you. It's about how it impacts on all of you. So, as I say, I, I have kept coming back. And that's the most important thing for me, or one of the most important things for me about Penny Brown. It is here for me all the way through, and it provides something for me at all the different stages that I reach. So it's not a one-off offer, it's not a point where somebody says, actually, you've been here three or four times already, you've now got to start paying for it. That's the other thing, by the way, I ought to mention. It is a huge irony, I find, that at the point at which your cost of living goes through the ceiling, organic food, my God, <laughs> your income drops through the floor. So 
And the fact that it is all provided free of charge to users like me is incredibly important. And it's, of course, only ever possible because of the incredible generosity of people like you. And I'm, I am hugely mindful of that, as we all are. But, as Alex has already touched on, Pennyborough is already starting to do more for different groups of people, people who are bereaved. It's all very well. I would really love to come here with my son and my husband. Got married to put that in there somewhere. <laughs> with with Andrew <laughs> Chemo, don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, that, that actually that, that there is a process that, that, that they understand what is happening to me and that they are here and are supported by this place after I am gone. That would make a huge difference to me. One of the things I can say this, I can say this again because I'm in a room full of lovely ladies. I honestly can't imagine what it's like for a man to go through this. It's hard enough for a bit of a control freak like me, but the men that I've met on the courses here are really find it so much harder. They don't have the same emotional vocabulary that we do. They are in much greater pressure, I think, not to cry or whatever else it is. I would love to see Penny Brown doing things that may be specifically for men or whatever. So there is always more. There is always, if you like, aspects of this that, that are to be explored and people supported through it. And again, I can only say that that is entirely down to the generosity that, that people like you make possible. For me, it's been a really interesting thing to come to terms with, what is my life now? What am I good for? If I'm not that person, who am I now? And I came across a poem by Emily Dickinson, I don't know if any of you have come across her, which for me absolutely sums up that no matter what, no matter how ill I become, actually there are things I can still do. And I'm going to read it, it's very short. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one lonely person into happiness again, I shall not live in vain. That's what the folk at Penny Brom do for people like me who stumble dazed and lost through their doors. <coughs> being here today is for me my way of doing that. You being here today is for me your way of doing that. And between us, I hope that is exactly what today's event will do. There is an envelope with my name on it on your table. I swear to you the money's not for me. <laughs> but I really sincerely hope that it will be, whatever you give today will be part of my legacy and yours. And I honestly cannot think of a finer testament to a life well lived than that. Thank you very much. Indeed.